Hello, today we show how to manipulate database using the um, Java Persistence API, which is um, an ORM object relational mapping type of technology, and it allows you to map, create direct mapping between a Java class and a database table. So that's one uh, Java object based on that class can be mapped directly to a row in the database table. ORM is very powerful because you can do a lot of database operations without any SQL whatsoever. And uh, today we have a same sample project than in the last tutorial. We have the customer class that represent a customer to be saved in database. We have an ID long and then couple of strings for first name and last name and some constructors. And then in the schema file, which is in the resources folder, we have I am this customer table that corresponds the customer object so same fields here so first thing before we start doing anything is to define a couple of dependencies to this um, pom file pom.xml and what we need first is we need a database technology so we are going to use the hg database which is embedded database running in the memory. It's very easy to configure. You could also use, of course, MySQL or another server-based database, but now we just use in-memory embedded database. And another dependency that we are going to use is um, Spring Data JPA, which actually enables us to do this JPA, Java Persistence API type of programming. So now that the dependencies are set, we can proceed to transforming this Pojo, plain old Java object, into an entity. Entity is a special class that is used by JPA to create the mapping between the database table and the class. So we mark this with entity annotation. There are many other annotations. We are only going to use a couple of them. And if you want to learn more, please study JPA. It's not only for Spring, it's for any other Java-based systems. So you can even use JPA in a standalone Java application. Um, in addition to entity, which makes this class to be applicable, to be used with the JPA, we define that this ID field is the primary key and it's going to have a generated value. So this generated value basically means that it's automatically incremented. We can also specify a strategy. And this would mean that it's automatically generated. Now, so we don't need to assign value. It will be created automatically or will assign automatically whenever we save, we save a new customer to the database. So that's it now. Next thing to do is to create the configuration file. It's a slightly more complex than we did in the previous video where we did the JDPC. And it has some elements that are similar. For example, it has the configuration as usual. We do the component scan as usual. And another difference here is that, or one difference here is that we add, um, well, we enable JPA repositories. And this one allows us to use entities in our application. And uh, we can specify here the name of the package, which will be scanned for JPA entities. So I'm just using the same package. This time it doesn't matter because the configuration file is in the same package. But if they are in the different packages, you have to specify. And also here you should specify the base packages. So we need also a data source, which is just like we did last time. So just a normal Java SQL data source. And this would return a new embedded database builder with um, type H2. 
and we add there a script, not that one. We add there a script, this schema.sql, so we can load the configuration script from the file and then build. So we are using embedded H2 database. Second thing that we configure, and now actually there are three more things to configure and they all of them are related to JPA. So the second thing to configure is so-called JPA vendor adapter, which allows different JPA vendors to add additional features to the basic JPA. And this will return a JPA vendor adapter. And just call it JPA adapter. And we have implementation Hibernate JPA vendor adapter. That's it. Um, you could add some features, of course, to the adapter, but for now we just leave it empty. Then the third thing that we are going to do or configure is local, it is a very horrible name, local container entity manager factory bean. Now this the local container entity manager factory bean is related to entity manager which is basically a, a component inside the spring framework that is taking care of the entities in the application. We don't really need to use this bean, actually we don't use any of these beans directly. They will be used by the spring framework, but we need to configure them. We create a new EMF, the Entity Manager Factory. And EMF takes a few settings. It takes data source. Well, actually, we could add here the data source. We could also add here the JPA vendor adapter. So these two data source JPA vendor adapter are connected by a spring to these beans. So it can automatically wire them together by based on the type. And we also set the JPA vendor adapter. And finally, this is uh, optional, but if you have uh, multiple packages, um, you can also set packages to scan for those entities. So I'm just going to type here net.ubilife.springjpa and return emf finally. Spring, why do I write spring? It should be string of course. Okay, and the last thing we need is called Platform Transaction Manager, which handles database transactions, and it takes the Entity Manager Factory as the parameter. And now, of course, well, this one is actually Entity Manager Factory, so it's going to be mapped to this one. And uh, well, we're going to use JPA Transaction Manager for this. And this JPA Transaction Manager will have this Entity Manager Mac Factory inside it so that we can it can use it that's it now one thing here is very important um, these two method names they must be exactly like this if they are different it will not work so make sure that entity manager factory method is like this and transaction manager me method is exactly like this the name of the method okay 
Now configuration is actually the hardest part. Next part is easy. We create repository. Uh, this is called customer repository. Because it's up to you what name you want. And this repository, um, we extend another interface. And that interface that we extend is called JPA repository. And it takes a customer. So this is the type that it will contain what kind of objects the JPA repository will, will be connected with. And what is the primary key type? It's a long. And you might want to add here some methods, which we'll do in a moment. But for now, this is it. Now, you may think, now, okay, my, maybe we should now implement this interface. But actually, we don't have to. The magic goes like this. When Spring is using this JPA repository, it can automatically implement some basic functions like insert or actually save, update, query. So there's some basic stuff already there. So we can simply use it without any implementation whatsoever. Um, let's create a test class, test app. And the test app, of course, will need to first load the configuration. and then get a bean from there. Of course, this is uh, looks quite strange. We only use interface and there is no implementation at all, but it still works. It's pretty cool. Let's create a new customer, John. Do, and we can replicate that to create another customer chain Do, and perhaps also a, a third customer Jack Smith. Okay, and now so we have three customers. Um, well, I can actually write here already repo save uh, you see that there there are methods like save already and this saves an entity and it returns the same entity that we can use in the application so let's just wrap these new objects around this repo save so they will be saved and the saved files or the objects will be returned back to us Oh, um, I forgot to save this. So let's save it. And now it's gone. Error is gone. Okay. So now magic has happened. Data should be there. We can do a little for loop. Temporary variable. To find all. And sys out the first name and last name. Let's see what happens. Okay, we get John Doe, Jane Doe, Jack Smith. We can also try to um, change something. So let's um, delete C1 and perhaps uh, C2 changes the first name to Janet, from Jane to Janet, and then we can update actually there is no update there is only save but save is also doing the update so we just we just um, save it so it will be replacing the old one because the id will be the same and then uh, we do the same for each loop to see what's the result let's run it okay there are some lot of um, information debug prints this is the first printout where we have all th three of them and the second printout where we have two of them and uh, john is missing and chain changed into janet okay so this is very powerful way of 
adding the basic operations like insert, update, delete. Um, but how about making more complex queries? Like now we can find one per ID. We can find one. Uh, so for example here, um, let me just delete this. So repo find. So you have find all and find one. Find one returns ID. But what if we want to find every um, every dose or every Smith in the database? Well, we can write a new method description in our interface. For example, find by last name. Last name. Now you might think maybe we have to implement this somewhere, but actually we don't. This is uh, using so-called query method language. So by method name, we actually define what we want to do. So we are going to find something using the last name. Um, we can also write, for example, find by last name and first name. So you can also combine them together. Now, if you make a mistake, say, just write find by last. It's going to see that as an error. It says invalid derived query, no property last found for type customer. So the customer class does not have last variable, instance variable. So the names must, in the names in the query method must match with your target objects fields. And if you make a typo, like have it the lowercase, it can also be an error. So it should be uppercase in this case, like because it's a camel case name. So, and of course here we need the first name as well. You can also do things like order by, so we can um, say order by last name, or well, let's say first order by first name descending so we are going to order the names by the first name first search by last name and then order by first name so let's see how we can use these methods remember we didn't implement we just defined them in interface so now we can do things like um, okay, instead of find all we do find by last name order by first name so let's put there doe now it should find both john and jane but in the order so that john is first jane is second because it's descending order so let's see what happens john is first jane is second now let's change it a little bit instead of descending let's use ascending So now change should be first. Yes. So this is a very powerful way of making database manipulation and you can add more features using this query language. Now there is a website, a Spring official documentation. It's a um, Spring Data JPA reference documentation and part 3.4 has some instructions how to write this query method. It has some examples how to use them so do study yourself and learn more how to make more complex queries. Thanks for watching.